Okay. Uh, this is Nagas. I'm a gynecology fellow from the Women and Infants Hospital of the Rhode Island. Today, I'm going to present the first article, as Dr. Benny mentioned. It's basically about uh, genomic profiling of primary and recurrent uh, adult granulosa cell tumors of the ovary. Uh, this is a very new uh, article published in Modern Pathology uh, from uh, uh, MS uh, KCC. Uh, Fondan University Cancer Center in Shanghai, China, uh, and uh, a group from Barcelona, Spain, and uh, another group from uh, Lida, Spain, if I'm correct, uh, pronouncing it right, and also Cleveland Clinic here in Ohio. So basically what uh, this study is looking at is adult uh, type granulos granulosa cell tumor that is a very rare malignant ovarian sex called a stroma tumor. Uh, in the over of 97% of the cases, these tumor harbor a uh, FOXL2 uh, hot spot mutation. Uh, and they usually have a very favorable prognosis, but they at the same time, they have a tendency to have a local uh, recurrence and late uh, recurrences. In some cases, it has been reported that recurrences have happened like 20 or 30 years after the initial diagnosis of the disease. And these cases are usually associated with a poor survival rate. Uh, another um, uh, mutation that has been reported in this uh, malignancy is a third promoter uh, hotspot mutation in the cases that has recurrences, almost 67% uh, of the cases had this mutation. Uh, compared with uh, those uh, primary cases that only had like up to 29% of third, third uh, promotion mutation. These cases usually had a significantly worse overall uh, survival. So basically, in this study, they're trying to determine uh, the genetic alter alterations that is associated with uh, AGCT disease progression uh, and to see whether there is any specific mutation or alteration that can predict these uh, tumor behaviors in the long term specifically. So, the uh, main method of the study here was sequencing that uh, they use a panel that use more than 410 uh, uh, genes uh, at Memorial Sloan Catering uh, Cancer Center. Uh, they uh, eight pathologists from different institutions after IRB approval reviewed cases. They came up with a final diagnosis of adult granulosa, granulosa cell tumors in 38 of their cases. They divided the cases in three groups, primary non-recurrent tumors, primary tumors with subsequent recurrence, uh, and they studied these cases with their uh, match recurrences, and uh, cases uh, that uh, were only recurrences from a primary tumor, they didn't have match primary tumors. They did, it's a very summarized uh, of the method, but I had only 10 minutes. So they did just targeted capture uh, massively prior sequencing uses, MSKK in, in integrated mutation profiling of actionable cancer targets uh, that they did the sequencing on tumor uh, and uh, uh, normal pairs from 26 patients. On the cases that they didn't have enough DNA to do sequencing, they did Sanger sequencing to assess the presence of uh, Fox L2 and third promoter uh, mutations. That sequences of somatic mutations uh, affecting cancer genes in primary and recurrence cases also were compared using two tail Fisher's exact test. So basically, they divided the result they observed in multiple groups. I uh, go um, over these results uh, very briefly. Basically, in terms of clinical pathological findings, they didn't see any significant differences in clinical uh, uh, like uh, features of uh, different clinical features and uh, um, in different clinical features, like the age didn't have uh, any meaningful differences between these groups. Uh, although all the cases that didn't have recurrences had very early stage of the disease, uh, but at the end there wasn't any significant differences in a stage in cases that had recurrences or didn't have the recurrences. The uh, other um, uh, one thing that I observed that they saw 
distinct genomic profile uh, the cases that had recurrences compared with cases uh, of just primary adult granulocyte tumor. All cases harbored uh, FOXL2 missense mutations. The third promoter mutations uh, in C250T locus were observed uh, in addition to previously described C228T uh, hotspot uh, locus. The higher number of third promoter uh, mutation was observed in the cases uh, that were recurrences compared with those that had, uh, were primary cases without any recurrences and primary with recurrences. Although there was higher number of somatic uh, mutations in cases with recurrences, there was no statistically significant difference in mutational burdens in between these groups. And recurrent mutation is uh, in GNAC KMT2C also observed. But because of a low number of the cases, they couldn't find any statistically significant in this group. In activating KM2D mutations that has been reported to be associated with recurrence in granulose, granulosa cell tumor in the past was, uh, they, uh, was found only in one case that was actually a primary with, without any recurrence. One very interesting finding was uh, finding TP53 mutation that was only observed in cases that there were recurrences of granulosa cell tumor. Uh, and these tumor didn't have any third promoter mutation. So this was something new uh, that was observed in this study. Uh, TIP2 mutation also was uh, found in lower number of the cases uh, in recurrence uh, with lower percentage of recurrence cases. Also those cases didn't have any third promoter uh, mutations. A stack to an IDH1 mutation also was observed in 11% uh, of the adult granulosis granulosa cell tumor and, and they matched recurrences, but it wasn't observed in the cases that didn't have any recurrence. So uh, they uh, described that these two groups, primary and recurrences, had overall similar copy number profile uh, and similar fraction of the genome that has been uh, undergone alteration. There was a higher frequency of C, uh, BKN2A, and B homozygote deletion in the recurrences and the primary recurrent cases compared with those cases that didn't have any recurrence. The homozygous deletion of BCL2L11 also identified in primary recurrent uh, cases and the cases uh, and the recurrence. So it's the primary cases and their recurrences, but it wasn't observed in the non-recurrent cases. So all these alteration was more related to cases that had recurrent and their recurrences, not in the cases that didn't have any recurrence. Uh, there are, uh, all, they also observe a specific mutation that is uh, altered uh, cell cycle pathway, as we mentioned, P53, or uh, CDK into uh, to A and B homozygote deletion uh, that was observed both in recurrences and primary recurrent cases. Uh, but the CDK and 1B deletion uh, observed in all three groups, it was observed in different percentages, different frequency. So they um, summarized that as like the cell cycle related gene and apoptosis uh, related genes has role in progression of uh, uh, granulosa cell tumor toward recurrence or metastasis later. The third promotion mutation uh, in primary adult granulosa cell tumor and the match recurrences were also uh, studied here. Two cases of primary that had uh, they did, didn't have third promoter mutation uh, but had matched um, uh, recurrences, they harbored clonal or subclonal mutation. And this finding suggests that the third promoter motion, uh, third muta uh, pro promoter mutation uh, were either selected from a minor subclone in these cases uh, that not has been de uh, detected in sequencing at the time or were acquired during the disease progression in these cases. Two cases uh, harbored clonal third promoter uh, mutation that were observed in the respective recurrences. And one case had only subclonal mutation that was uh, found in both primary and matched recurrence. 
the compos columnar composition of the paired primary and recurrence cases in this study showed that nine primary cases, they studied nine primary cases with their match recurrences. They all shared FOXL2, KM2, uh, KMT2C, MyoD1, KM2, KMT2D, uh, PICTUR1, and TER promoter. All of them were shared between primary and recurrences. But MED12, uh, SH2D1A, and subcolonial T2, uh, TET2 mutation only were observed in recurrences, and two granulosa cell tumor recurrences uh, uh, acquired alteration in cell cycle related genes like P53 mutation or CDKN2AB uh, homo homozygote deletion uh, only in their. Um, recurrences. They were not observed in the primary tumor. So basically there were changes that observed in both and changes that only observed in the rec recurrences. So I think that uh, in summary, uh, they suggested that these uh, new um, uh, profile of genomic alteration can be used potentially to predict the tumor behavior of the adult granulosal cell tumor in their future. Uh, they um, found higher third promoter hot spot mutation in recurrences than in primary cases, and they found new uh, alteration that affects the cell cycle uh, progression and autosis related genes, uh, including p53, that can play a role in the progression of the um, adult granulosa cell tumors. Uh, and also, uh, although um, they uh, uh, analyzed, uh, analyzed a small number of the cases, they found that pair primary and match recurrent adult granulosa cell tumor, they, there are uh, specific genes like P53, T2, uh, MET12, and SH2D1A that most commonly were associated with uh, disease progression because they were observed in the recurrences and they were not observed in the primary uh, cases or the cases that didn't have recurrences. The limitation of this study, uh, it was, uh, although it was a multi-centric study, they had a limited number of the cases. So a lot of the uh, result that they uh, mentioned in the paper was not uh, statistically significant. Uh, also, as they mentioned themselves in the paper that uh, they had a selection bias uh, in these cases because they chose, chose cases that had been referred to uh, big cancer centers. Uh, I think the, the good essence of this uh, study was they did a very comprehensive genomic analysis. Although the uh, DNA, uh, the, the sample DNA was limited, they could uh, evaluate a good number of the genes in this study. And of course, there are some new genes that has been never reported in the past that they shown that they, it may be related to progression of the disease in adult granulosa cell tumor. And I think potentially uh, these uh, molecular panels can be done on the new diagnosed cases to predict the behavior of the cases, can, the disease over the like long period of the time, like uh, whether the patient need to have closer follow-up or like more, um, more study to be done on the cases that have more specific genomic alteration. And thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Nargis. Um, that was really nice. Uh, and it was a very complicated paper with lots of data. So, um, I'm, uh, oh, you stopped sharing. So that was uh, really nicely done. It was a complicated subject. Um, does anyone have any immediate questions before we move on? Or I think the author is with us. Do you have anything you'd like to add or one of the authors? No? Okay. Um, I think to go in order, I believe Kyle, you would be next if you want to go next. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me share my screen and make sure that this works okay. All right, can you guys see everything? Yes, you look awesome. good. Awesome. Go ahead. Oh, and uh, the last one ran a little long, but your paper is not quite as long, so maybe we can make up some time here. I think you have to, yeah, there you go. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. it's a pretty short paper, so hopefully we can catch up a little bit. Um, and normally I'm fine with folks interrupting, but maybe if we leave questions for the end, it might make this go a little bit faster. 
Uh, so I'm Kyle. I'm a fourth year resident right now at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And in just like a month, um, I'll be starting my fellowship in GYN and GU pathology uh, over at MGH in Boston. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about a paper um, that came out discussing, um, asking a very specific question about bilateral uh, ovarian Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. Uh, you'll probably recognize some of the authors here, uh, notably uh, the first author, uh, Dr. Glenn McCluggage. Um, he's published quite a bit on a variety of topics in GYN pathology. Um, pretty prominent pathologist um, from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Uh, and basically, they're asking a very straightforward question here. So just a little bit of background on Sertoli cell tumors of the ovary first. Um, they're sort of separated into three uh, different types, um, depending on their level of differentiation. And what's kind of uh, arisen in the last few years is it seems like uh, there's a difference between well differentiated and these intermediate or poorly differentiated tumors. Uh, there's about a 10 year uh, difference in average age between them uh, with the intermediate and poorly differentiated tumors occurring in younger patients. Uh, those intermediate and poorly differentiated tumors also have an association with DICER-1 mutations. And this really depends on the study with, uh, there's a different you know, overall percentage of cases with DICER-1 mutations that are identified depending on the study you look at. But if you look at some of the more recent studies, including one that I think Dr. McCluggage was involved with, he found that I think he looked at like 40-ish cases and almost all of them, um, all but one I think, actually had a DICER-1 uh, mutation, either somatic or germline, in this intermediate poorly differentiated group. Uh, and well-differentiated tumors, at least the ones he looked at, none of them had uh, DICER-1 mutation. So it's looking like there's a separate um, pathogenesis there. And there's also a difference in prognosis with your well-diff tumors. Almost all of them have you know, basically 100% survival. And then intermediate or poorly differentiated, uh, it sort of depends on the stage um, at diagnosis and whether or not there are heterologous stromal elements. Uh, some of them uh, can progress. So anyway, the question they're asking is, do patients who have bilateral uh, ovarian involvement by Sertoli Leydig cell tumors, um, are these the same tumor? Is you know, one a metastasis to the other ovary, or are these actually completely separate primary tumors? And this is, of course, when the tumor is only involving ovaries. You know, if it was involving other areas in the peritoneum, it's a little bit more obvious that it's a metastasis. So he was looking at just bilateral ovarian involvement. And most of the cases he was looking at were uh, separated by time. So temporarily separated, you know, not most patients didn't present with bilateral ovarian involvement at first. There was some time period between when one uh, tumor was removed and then when the other ovary was found to be involved. And basically what they did was they selected cases, um, both from uh, the archives of uh, Dr. McCluggage and also uh, some from uh, McGill University in Montreal. And um, basically, uh, they did a mutational analysis in the cases that uh, they gathered. Um, they looked specifically at these RNAase 3A and 3B domains, which uh, are enriched with hotspot mutations in um, these Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. And they looked at them both by screening PCR, and then they also did um, just old fashioned Sanger sequencing uh, to look at these uh, specific domains. Uh, and in combination with that, they also wanted to do a literature review of bilateral Sertoli Leydig cell tumors to see uh, what else they could find published on the topic. And here's kind of their results in a quick view. I didn't copy the table, obviously, for copyright reasons, but uh, they obviously go into much more detail. But in short, um, they only had three patients with bilateral Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. Um, all of them uh, were separated by time, so they were all metachronous tumors. Um, and all of them were intermediate or poorly differentiated. And uh, all cases uh, were in patients with a confirmed germline mutation. So this was all in patients with this germline DICER-1 uh, syndrome. And um, basically, uh, on their mutational analysis, they found that in every patient, um, these were completely separate tumors. So all tumors had you know, one inactivating mutation that the patient was carrying in their germline or mosaically. And then uh, there was a different somatic mutation identified in one of these uh, hotspot zones in each tumor. So 
uh, pretty definitive evidence that these tumors were arising de novo, they were not clonally related. Um, and they also did a literature review. So uh, they found 29 published cases um, of patients with a bilateral sertoliolytic cell tumor. Uh, two of them were patients included in their study. And um, most of them, it, the, the kind of the difficulty with the literature review is a lot of these cases, they didn't know DICER-1 germline status. The DICER-1 association was only, you know, has only been known uh, for the last several years. So uh, a lot of the older case reports, including the largest case series, which I think was done in 1985 um, by Dr. Scully, uh, found that, um, uh, you know, a lot of those older cases, there's no DICER-1 status mentioned because the association wasn't known at the time. Um, but they did conclude that most of these tumors, all but two of them in the literature review, were moderately or poorly differentiated. There were two reports they found um, with well-differentiated tumors that involved bilateral ovaries, but the author reviewed the photos, and Dr. McCluggage thinks that in at least one of those cases, it was a patient with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, and it looked more like the hamartomas or you know, Sertoli cell adenomas that patients get in that syndrome. Uh, but one of them uh, did look like, from the pictures, uh, to be a well-differentiated Sertoli latex cell tumor. So that was sort of interesting. Maybe one case of well diff involving both ovaries. Um, but most of the bilateral Sertoli latex cell tumors, they concluded probably occur in the setting of this germline dicer syndrome, uh, rather than you know completely sporadic tumors, and their reasoning for that is um, only uh, nine published cases had uh, germline testing. In all nine of those cases, uh, there was a germline dicer one mutation. So you know a lot of the cases they looked at weren't tested at all. So it's possibly that you know it's possible some of those patients did not have the syndrome. Uh, but we really don't know. And all the cases that were tested did have this mutation. So um, they're suggesting that, you know, perhaps all of these patients with bilateral involvement um, are arising in this Dicer syndrome. And that makes sense. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so, you know, what are the implications of this study? Um, if you can say that in most of these cases, uh, these are, you know, completely separate de novo tumors rather than uh, metastasis, it could save the patient um, some chemotherapy. There's no you know, defined uh, treatment regimen for patients with these tumors, um, but you know, it, from what I can find, uh, clinical recommendations, there is some discussion of potential chemotherapy for patients who have recurrent disease, um, even for patients who just have poorly differentiated or heterologous uh, mesenchymal elements. You know, there's a discussion for chemo, so you might be able to save them uh, from the chemo that they may be getting if this, the clinicians think this is recurrent. And it also just sort of contributes to our understanding of this syndrome. And it's, it's really interesting because it's different than our recent developments uh, in understanding of epithelial ovarian tumors, because we used to think that, you know, some of these cases with bilateral involvement of, say, like a, a low-grade endometrioid tumor were potentially separate uh, primaries, but it seems like from recent data that a lot of these tumors arrived as saying in different ovaries are probably, uh, or most of them are clonally related. Uh, but it's, so it's kind of different from that story here uh, with our uh, sertoliolytic cell tumors. And uh, obviously, you know, one of the weaknesses of this study is that there are very few cases that the authors analyzed. There's only three patients that they looked at with these bilateral tumors, but you have to remember this is super rare. I mean, this is a rare tumor, uh, a rare syndrome, and in their literature search, they can only find 29 incidences uh, of this in the literature of bilateral uh, involvement. So, you know, taken in context, you know, it's not a bad little series. Um, and it was interesting in that they were able to sort of ask a specific question, and it's kind of a very nice study in that regard. Very clear question. They looked at it and got an answer, but there are very few cases they used. Uh, and they also, you know, the cases that they looked at were only patients with this germline Dicer-1 syndrome. Again, they mentioned that it's possible that all of these cases with bilateral involvement are patients with Dicer-1 syndrome. And it sort of makes sense because obviously those patients have one hit already in this gene. So their cells are sitting around in their ovaries and they're more likely to undergo a second hit and develop a new sporadic tumor. Um, but 
it's possible that some of the case reports, the ones that weren't tested, were actually you know, sporadic tumors in patients without a germline dicer syndrome. And in these patients, we don't really know uh, if this is actually uh, you know, separate tumor, if it's metastasis of the same one. So that remains to be looked at potentially. Um, and I already kind of talked about you know, their literature search and the, so in, for the interest of time, I'll move on. Um, you may never run into a situation like this. So there's potentially limited um, ability for you to carry this information over into your daily practice. Most people will never encounter this rare situation of bilateral ovarian involvement with a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. But if you do now, you have a little bit of information, a study that could potentially help guide your discussions with clinicians about it. Uh, it does definitely open up some opportunities for future studies. I mean, one of them being, you know, are there cases um, of bilateral involvement that are sporadic? And if so, are those metastases or separate tumors? Uh, and then also, um, we met, talk a lot about DICER-1 here, but for well-differentiated sertoli leydig cell tumors, there hasn't really been a, you know, recurrent genetic abnormality identified in most of those cases. So uh, there's potential uh, for that to be investigated um, as well. And I think that's all I have. Uh, trying to keep this in a decent amount of time, but if folks have questions, happy to answer. No, that, that was really well done. You're right. It's um, it's so uncommon. I uh, even in two years of doing a fellowship at a place with a lot of consults, we I don't remember running into one of these patients. I have seen a patient with Dyser syndrome. She had recurred three times um, by a pretty young age. Um, so I think um, what I don't know is does the kind of surgery they do up front affect whether or not the patients do recur, you know, because a lot of times these patients are very young and they still want to have children. So, um, but that was a, yeah, that was a really nice article and it would be interesting to try to find non-syndromic patients who have bilateral tumors, but it seems like a lot of those might end up being metastatic foci, so. Yeah. That's true, and that's clear. And I don't remember if that was in the article, but you know, obviously, the patients who had uh, these tumors involving both ovaries, they were temporarily separated. So clearly, right. in those patients, they didn't remove the other ovary. Um, right. I don't know if they would. Uh, you know, again, like you said, pretty much all of these patients are young. Yeah. So and a lot of times, I cases, yeah. And a lot of times, which fertility. you know, most people on this call know, a lot of times the diagnosis maybe isn't suspected going in because ne right. they're not necessarily that big. So it might not even be an oncologist doing the surgery. So you might get a, you know, one-sided salpingoophorectomy and then they counsel the patient whether they're going to go back and take the rest, which just segues perfectly into our next topic. So um, yeah, if anyone has any other questions for um, Kyle, we can get to those at the end. Sam, are you still with us? I just see a black box with your name on it. Okay, you you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Okay, I think if you share your screen, it'll take over, and I'll go away. All righty. So. Okay. All righty. I'm uh, Samuel Grindstaff. I'm one of the fellows at Women and Infants. The uh, case that I'm, uh, or the study I'm reviewing today, is a, about conservative surgery in stage one adult type granulosa cell tumors and its results from the MITO-9 study. And that's a, um, a group of, of uh, multi-center Italian trial of ovarian cancer and kind of logic malignancies. So what they were looking, or just as a little bit of a background, um, they were looking at uh, how effective is fertility sparing surgery in apparent stage one adult type of granulosa cell tumor compared to uh, radical surgery. Um, these tumors are uh, the most common sex cord stromal tumor, but they're still not common. Um, they are treated surgically, uh, the, the current standard being um, a TA, THBSO and comprehensive sta uh, staging, including omentectomy and peritoneal biopsies. 30% uh, of AGCTs are diagnosed in childbearing women who may want to preserve uh, fertility. Um, and these tumors generally have an indolent course. And as we talked about earlier, it has, they tend to recur late um, with their occurrence rate as high as 64%, which is what was cited in this study. Um, poorer outcome has been reported in the past in the fertility sparing groups as opposed to the uh, radical surgery groups. And so they wanted to give this a more thorough 
look. So they selected patients um, with uh, parent stage one adult type granulosa cell tumors um, that were followed at their institutions. Uh, they collected uh, all the pertinent data for it. Um, the rad radical surgery was performed on all patients where fertility was not an issue. And of course, the fertility sparing surgery was done primarily on the younger patients. Uh, excluding patients uh, upstaged after, uh, they excluded all patients that were upstaged after secondary uh, staging procedures or who had, bio, or they found had bilateral disease. Uh, and the, the tumors were staged, many of them retrospectively uh, by the FIGO2 uh, 2014 standards. And they analyzed the data, including the patient's characteristics, calculated the disease-free and overall survival. Um, and they did the Kaplan-Meier curves on those and then uh, did some statistical analysis on, on that to see if uh, what was significant. So what they, they were able to uh, gather uh, records on 229 patients, 78 of which had uh, fertility sparing surgeries and 161 had radical surgeries. Um, the FSS group is subdivided into those who had a cystectomy, um, a cystectomy followed by a unilateral salpingectomy or a unilateral salpingectomy up front. Uh, many uh, of the adult type granulosa cell tumors um, may present as a, as a cyst and so it will be, can be taken out by a benign surgeon and then have to go back to get, um, to take all of it. So the, uh, the, for the FSS, the relapse rate was significantly higher than the radical surgery uh, group. So the, that's 37.2% versus 18%. Um, the FSS group had significantly worse disease-free survival at five years, uh, 50 versus 74%. The USO group, so those who had uh, the unilateral salpingectomy up front, uh, did not have a significant difference in disease-free survival at 10 years, being 73 versus 70%, and that was not significant. Uh, cystectomy alone had uh, the worst disease-free survival, as, as you'd expect. Um, and then cystectomy followed by, by uh, USO uh, showed improved uh, prognosis, but still was significantly worse than radical surgery and was kind of uh, kind of in the middle between the two groups. Uh, only five deaths in patients, three from disease and two from other causes. And for disease specific overall survival, there is not a significant difference between those who received F uh, the FSS versus RS. So here are, uh, this is a, a look at, at, the, at the groups um, and I think the, I think we've covered everything that's relevant there. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves that we can see here when we're looking at the disease, oops, disease-free survival. The RS group um, has uh, significantly better uh, disease-free survival until after 10 years it get it, it closes that that closes down. But if we separate it into the groups, we have those who had uh, just a cystectomy, which had the worst disease-free survival, followed those by those that had a follow-up uh, unilateral salpingo oophorectomy, and those who had a unilateral to begin with did about the same as the as the RS group. And then for overall survival, there wasn't a statistical significance between the two. So let's see. So these findings correlate with prior studies showing no difference in overall survival between uh, fertility sparing surgery and radical surgery in stage one adult uh, granulosa cell tumors, uh, but also showing a decreased disease-free survival. Prior uh, data from the same, same group from 1965 to 2008 uh, showed no difference between FSS and RS. However, um, in that, that group, um, they almost exclusively did cystectomy or did unilateral salpingo oophorectomies instead of cystectomies. And so they, based on this, this uh, study, we would expect those to be about the same. Um, FSS does not affect overall survival. It only affects disease-free survival. And uh, for those who have 
uh, or a suspected granulosa cell tumor, unilateral salpingo-oophorectomy is the preferred uh, diagnosis, including uh, going back if a primary cystectomy is done and it's found to go back and, and uh, complete that site if they want to preserve fertility. So the, the strengths of this study is it's a large uh, retrospective study. The adult granulosa cell tumors are fairly rare, and so being able to get this many cases was uh, really, really good. I had solid analysis and effective charts to highlight those things. Um, some of the limitations, uh, the selection bias, um, just due to the retrospective nature of the study. Surgical staging was not systematically offered to the RSS patients. Um, uh, and the centralized pathology review was not performed. So they just relied on, on the pathologist at whatever institution uh, did the, the reports. Uh, prospective studies may be helpful to confirm the results. Um, the limitation with this is because they recur so late, you'd have to have a very long follow-up time to perform a study like that, which would make it very difficult to do. So the, the applications for this, uh, it, the main thing is uh, that you can have fertility sparing surgery for patients who have a uh, unilateral uh, stage one adults type uh, granulosa cell tumors. And so if I were to diagnose a, a, an AGCT incidentally on cystectomy in a younger patients, I can confidently recommend that uh, doing a, a unilateral salpingo oophorectomy is appropriate. And it doesn't affect overall survival, though, uh, with the caveat that they have a, uh, an increased risk of uh, disease-free survival, so the increased risk of recurrence in those, those patients. But they should be able to preserve fertility and, and overall do very well. And that's all I have. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Grindstaff? One thing I was wondering, um, Sam, is uh, we get a lot of frozen section requests. I mean, not just where we work, but most pathologists who do GYN pathology, even as part of their frozen section um, tasks, that um, a simple looking cyst isn't something we always freeze. So it makes you wonder if you should freeze a piece sometimes to make sure it's not a granulosa cell tumor because it seems like the data supports that doing that USO up front would perhaps be better for the patient. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's that's what the data yeah. shows, and the the thought is that um, that there's some spillage because you rarely get a, a right. clean margin off of the the cystectomies, and so. Right. Um, so you're leaving take, some of it behind in the ovary for you're some leaving some in the ovary and and so and then even if you go back and take that ovary there's still some of uh, it hanging around someplace hanging around someplace <laughs> it, it can anyway so that's that's yeah. the thought behind that yeah yeah it's uh it's hard to know though because um, granulosa cell tumors I think I saw a case one time when I was a resident of a liver mass in a like perimenopausal age woman and she forgot to tell anyone that she'd had a granulosa cell tumor about 20 years ago and it was a cystic granulosa cell tumor metastatic to her liver and I think somebody figured it out because they found her case from you know at that point distant past when the medical records had barely even been converted so um, it's just something to keep in mind especially with those late recurrences um, the other association for trainees is that granulosa cell tumors can secrete hormones. So um, sometimes you'll find these tumors in the ovaries of patients who have um, sort of an estrogen-driven proliferation of the endometrium, like a endometrioid adenocarcinoma or sort of um, like the atypical hyperplasia. So that's another good correlate to kind of keep your eye on, but not usually in these reproductive-aged women, which is kind of what this study focused on. So. Um, that brings us to the end of our uh, Journal Club formal presentation. Is there anyone um, who'd like to show their face or say hello or um, tell us where you're coming in from? So I also have a question. My name is oh. Devi Jaychandran. Okay. Uh, I'm a GYN pathologist at uh, Roswell Park. Um, so you said uh, like um, maybe we should uh, freeze 
that's an uh, like an option, right? Maybe we can freeze some of the simple cyst, simple or like assist when it comes for a cystectomy. Mm. Um, so, is there any gross um, thing or something which will lead us or help us to freeze that particular cyst? Or I mean, I mean, I'm I'm happy to have anyone else comment who would like to. In my experience, I I cannot remember ever seeing a simple cyst at frozen and then having it pop up to be a granulosa cell tumor on permanent section. I know it does happen. The mm -hmm. other thing that I would say is that a lot of the surgeons who are doing these cystectomies are not oncologists. So sometimes yes. they're not even sending them for frozen section. So um, a lot of times if they have any concerns, they will send them, but sometimes they don't even know that what they're looking at could be, for example, you know, one in a however many thousands could be a, a granulosa cell tumor. My instinct is always to freeze anything that has a solid component. And most of the granulosa cell tumors that I've picked up incidentally on frozen section were more of that solid look. And then they tend to have um, a similar appearance to those tumors that are making hormones. So they tend to be kind of yellow looking and more solid. Um, mm -hmm. So those I would freeze for sure. It's those cystic granulosa cell tumors that maybe there's not much you can do, especially if they're not sending it for frozen section. I mean, th at that point, they're going to have to go back no matter what you say. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah that's a good yeah. question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then somebody else pop, popped their face up. They didn't say hi. And Bruce, Bruce, we know you're coming from the UK. Thank you for joining us. Are you a, a practicing pathologist or a trainee? Oh, or? No, I'm a practicing gynae pathologist. Oh, that's nice. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you found this helpful. No, it was good fun. Oh, good. Okay. And Sw Swati, would you like to say hi? You're muted, so I can't hear you. Do you want to unmute yourself and say hi? Hi, where are you coming from? Um, I'm from India. I'm a senior resident here. Awesome. That's great. So, well, thank you for joining us. And Sam Reen, I see. You. Hi. Where are you coming from? Uh, I'm from Dallas. I'm a first year uh, at Baylor. Oh, cool. And this is my first time here. Um, I think it was really a nice session. Oh, good. I'm glad you joined us. It's nice to have. Yeah, yeah it's nice to have some virtual options since it's not just yeah. the states where we're all staying away from each other. I think everyone in the whole world is trying to stay away from one another right now. So that's great. Um, well, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. And um, I'll send the follow-up quiz and it has that eval at the end that you can fill out. And then also it'll have the information for next month. So if you want to present, just let me know. I'd be happy to sure. walk you through it. If you're nervous about presenting, you can practice with me ahead of time. So just let me know. But uh, that's all we have for today. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.